Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us. Excited that you're here. We're going to share about how to get kids excited for math. We're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about student engagement. We're going to talk about the use of manipulatives. We're going to talk about not relying on the workbook. And we're going to talk about the my big secret and how we're going to get everyone involved. Okay, let's talk about student engagement. So here's something I think about when I set up my classroom. I believe in having a carpet area. So whether I'm in a fifth grade classroom or I'm in a kindergarten classroom, I think students need movement. And so one of the things I set up from the very beginning is there is a spot for us to collaborate on the carpet area. I have our desks as a part of that's where we work. That's where our whiteboards stay. That's where our manipulatives stay. That's where the stuff is. We are workbook. We that's all left on the desk. The carpet area for me is where I have a captive audience. When I bring you to the carpet, you don't bring anything with you because I have taken work that's been done at the desks, example, whiteboards, trays, manipulatives, et cetera. And I have now brought them under our document camera or just right in front. As you can see, we're doing some like routine type stuff right now in that image, but I'm doing that because I want students to have, to be captive. I don't want them to be messing around with what's on their board, continuing to draw. Like I, and I'm, I hate nagging. So if I, if they don't even have the option of bringing it to the carpet, then I have a captive of audience and I'm telling them this is the work I want us to discuss. We're not discussing what you just did necessarily. We're not discussing your work. We we will discuss it. You might even discuss it at your table groups. But right now I want you on the carpet just focused on this problem or the way that this person solves. So I get a captive audience, but that creates engagement because it's a change of pace, it's a change of scenery. When we sit in the same location for the entire 60 minutes, it's hard to stay engaged, right? So I'm trying Trying to create this movement of I want you to do a problem on your whiteboard and then I want you to come to the carpet we're going to discuss okay go back to your desk I want you to do the next two problems or even like go do something in your workbook okay let's come back let's compare answers let's compare methods whatever the case is okay so student engagement carpet area for me is somewhat of a must movement on that same note, so not only movement of let's move from our desks to the carpet, but there's also a time where during that time, I'm transitioning by counting. So we're transitioning from science into math. We're transitioning from math to recess. Like whatever it is, we're, we're moving because we're having to pack up stuff. We're having to line up, but we're always counting. So we're counting by decimals if I'm in fifth grade. We're counting by time at the end of first grade. We're counting by measurements, like centimeters. We're counting by fives. We're counting by twos. Like we don't just count by ones. We don't just count forward. Now I might have them count forward if I'm in kindergarten starting at the number 23, but I don't have them count always from one because part of the standard, no matter which grade you are, is being able to count off decade and off like base one system. Okay. So it's not just count by ones. It's count by one starting at 23, count by 10 starting at 23. What would I say? What would you do if I said count by a hundred starting at 23? So while we're moving, we're also counting. Okay. The other movement you can see here that friends are, you know, putting their hands on their head. They're doing like, maybe put your thumb in your heart box. I do, you know, a lot of math mountain chain like partner, partner, total, total at the top. We're doing story problems. And I have students always act out, not, not necessarily the story problem. We are doing that in some respect, but it's more of acting out the situation. Like, are we comparing someone has more, someone has less? Here's the difference. So now they just read a story problem. I said, so who had the most? They're like Sarah had the most. I said, everyone show it. Sarah had the most. Maybe I'm in fifth grade and I said numerator on the top, denominator on the bottom. Like everything for me is total physical response. And I'm trying to cross the midline as often as I can. So our younger grades like K2, you do a lot with your daily routines. Both of you do where you do counting with finger flashing and we count the tens on our left and the ones on our right. Like I make kids get really big, like stand up to do this part. Okay, sit back down, listen to this part, stand back up. Let's do this part, let's sit down. So. If you're in the squad, you know I include that in my videos. I do a lot of total physical response where I want kids to use their whole body to share that they have the answer, their whole body to say the answer. I think that increase that in increases a lot of engagement. So I want you to put something in the chat right now about a way that you've increased movement or how you use your carpet area. So maybe you have a specific uh, brain break that they do, but how is it related necessarily to math? So there are, there's so many great brain breaks for movement and for crossing the midline. I'm thinking, how can I use that time to also capitalize on their number sense, on the math skills they are not fluent in, 
so on and so forth. How can I use it even to increase memory and to boost retention? Okay, so add that to my chat for me. Student collaboration. So the other way that I'm gonna increase engagement is not being the only human that's talking, right? We definitely become that Charlie Brown of wah, 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 wah. And instead of becoming that teacher, I need to make sure that I never go longer than 10 minutes. And really you should go never longer than the age of the students, right? So if your students are five, you should not be chatting for more than five Five minutes before you give them time to collaborate in some way, right? Like turn to your neighbor, tell them what I just said, teach your neighbor, like peanut butter and jelly, peanut butters, teach jelly. Everyone say what I just said, you know, John, I want you to turn to the class, tell them again, like there's something that's happening in terms of student collaboration and student engagement. So students working together. So I might say number of kids and say, you're one, two, three, four at the table group. And I might say once teach your table what did we just say? How did we know that Puzzle Penguin was wrong? I want you to pretend that no one just heard me talk and now you have to prove that Puzzle Penguin was wrong. Prove it and teach it to your group. I want students to remember and to know and to believe that the classroom is their community. They're all teachers. It's not just me. So if they, every time they get stuck, they come back to me, it is a teacher-centered classroom. I need them to know that their peers can offer so much support. That student collaboration, when kids get to work with kids, I increase that student engagement. Not even to mention that John Hattie's visual uh, mathematics research talks about how the highest effect size of almost anything we do in the classroom is reciprocal teaching, kids teaching kids, okay? So we know that that's an important aspect of what we're doing in the room. So that's how we're going to increase engagement. You can see that there are students here that are having to think about an answer, like a Kagan strategy, numbered heads, if you use that in your classroom, where students all have to collaborate on an answer. In this case, they're all doing a learning bridge. That's like the, the signal that I give them of when you've finished and you've come up with a consensus or you've come up with an answer, you've both taken your turn, do a learning bridge. That signals to me that that group is ready and I can help move us on versus everyone starting to get off task. And it sounds like kids are still engaged, but really they're not. You can see over here on the right that that picture is more of that solve and discuss method. Remember that math expressions has solve and discuss. It's in the teacher's guide. In fact, I just spent some time the other day looking in the, in the appendix of the teacher's edition, and I looked up in that glossary, like solve and discuss. Some grade levels have it in weird, like some, some list it as a subcategory under math talk. Others list it like as its own line item. And then I had to search like the online TE for the ones that didn't list it at all. I'm like, I know it's in here. And so then I searched by words in the online TE shows up everywhere. So remember that solve and discuss is a math talk structure and it's a way to get kids to do student engagement. So it's where everyone solves. So if you can see there in that student example, every single student has done the math. They have visuals to prove it. But one student is asked to explain to the group, notice everyone's leaning in, she's showing, holding up her board, and then she says, do you have any questions? They have to ask her questions, and then she has to justify. So it doesn't always have to be student collaboration as a kid comes up to the front of the room. I want kids from the very beginning of school to do this and to know that we're going to work together in every math classroom. And this is not an, an independent, you're on your own type of class. You know, another way that we're going to increase manipulatives here, and maybe you name your partners, maybe you do a numbering system. I don't know. I would, we would love to hear the things that you're doing and put that in the comments. So share your ideas. I know you're doing cool things. We want to hear what it is. All right, look at our manipulatives. Okay. So when it's hands-on, it's just naturally more engaging. I can't tell you the number of classrooms that I walk in and Students instantly get out their workbook, they get out their pencil, they open up to the next page and they just stare at me. And I'm like, well, we're not going to use that today. So go ahead and close your workbook and put it away. And they're like perplexed. Like they're, they're surprised. They're like, what do you mean? This is math class. Like, this is what we do. We work in a workbook. And I'm like, no, the workbook is a component of math class. It's where we practice and apply. It is not where we start the learning. It is not where we do the learning. Like in my world, that's done on whiteboards and it's done with these tools. So I'm going to launch a question in an inquiry way, which is how expressions was designed. And I'm going to let kids figure out how to we use these tools to defend their answer. I want them to use the whiteboard. Notice that this is comparison bars in first grade. These fourth and fifth graders are, they're actually on their whiteboard. They already solved the problem numerically, but now I said, well, now prove it with your, your, your materials here, your fraction strips, right? This is kindergarten matching the teen equations and then having to build the teen equation. So 
I'm not saying they do that for every problem, but even on a workbook, I might say, I want you to do numbers one, three, and five. Then you have to choose one of them that you can defend with manipulatives. So if you already learned the method, you know, a numeric way, you know how to, you found a pattern to solve them. Great. Circle one. And then with your partner, figure out how your math tools that I put on your desk, maybe one kid gets place value blocks, one kid got uh, secret code cards, one kid get, I don't know, whatever it is, they have to defend their work using that tool. It increases engagement, it increases understanding. It's, it's just a win-win all the way. So you can see here, like this is our large giant on the right-hand side, our large giant whiteboard. It's called the teacher board in expressions. So it came in the big math expressions kits. Like the teachers got these really big giant ones. I mean, they're like the, my, my, the width of my arm span. Okay. And so you can see in this classroom, like the kids were like putting up everything on their whiteboard and then on their individual whiteboards, kids are working through, like draw a picture. Where does it go on the math mountain? Add your labels. Like we do way more on our whiteboard because I'm just building understanding. I also want kids to, they're just naturally more engaged. Like the whiteboard is more engaging than a workbook. They'll take more risks. They'll try more ways and a workbook. They're just thinking, I want to get done. Like this is about mastery. So they're just working through the problems. They don't want to stop and discuss them. They don't want to defend them. And they will not not work ahead, even though you've asked them like 800 times. Okay. So we want them to do a lot of start on the work, the whiteboard, and then use your manipulatives and then move to the workbook to practice and apply. You can see the same thing here. So all of these kids were working out their long division problems. They're still learning and comparing different methods. Then they'll make it permanent in their books, but they're doing it here. And now they're up on the floor discussing and, and comparing. You can see that this is from actually the Math Genius Squad on the left. So this fourth grade group has one of our work mats where they're doing problems from the workbook, but they're doing it in multiple ways. I'm saying, I want you to build it with your secret code cards. I want you to represent it, draw it. I want you to show it on the number line. Like we're doing problems from the workbook. We're just doing less problems, but more with them it's definitely more engaging. So obviously, right, the best way to get students excited about math is for you to be excited about math. Like I'm genuinely excited, as you can tell, about math, but more I'm interested, I'm in generally excited about like what they think. So I love just posing a question to kids and saying things like, would you just share your, your thinking on this? Like, how would you maybe solve this? And I post the question, maybe it's double digit edition or something. And I'll say, I want you to show me two different ways. And them doing their work on their whiteboard, I am generally, like genuinely excited about it. Like I take their whiteboards, I'm like, that is so interesting. Like I never have had anyone do that. And I've seen it a lot. Or I love that I'm seeing like three different methods right now. Like second graders, you are rocking my world. Like I, I generally get excited and then they get excited. You know, they're thinking oh, next time I'm going to show another way. Or she really likes it when we also use our tools. Like I'm sending the message of what I really love. I love that you made a mistake. You didn't erase it. You let us discuss it. And then you knew how you were going to change your mind and revise your thinking. Like that type of a classroom, kids get excited because they're not shut down. I'm not shutting down their intuition, but I'm also not letting a wrong answer be wrong. I'm saying we have to discuss it, but I'm keeping the conversation going. I'm keeping it open. So that's a part of our getting kids excited and engaged. So here's some action steps for you. Okay. So for tonight, one is consider one of the ways that you're going to boost engagement this year. So I just said like a million ideas, choose one. That feels like it's more in alignment with who you are in the classroom and something that's not so far fetched that it would just be like a total shift of everything you've ever done. And it, and it may not stick. OK, so sometimes when we make too big of moves. It doesn't stick. And then we're tired by Tuesday and we give up. So I want you to choose something that I've said tonight that you're like, I'm going to try to do more of. OK, I'm going to fill in that blank. What's your engagement strategy that you're going to try? Okay, go give that for me. And then it says incorporate student collaboration. So that's one of the ideas, okay, is how do you do more of that? And then stepping away from the workbook. So those are two ideas. I also talked about the carpet area. I talked about the use of the manipulatives. I talked about uh, your excitement level. Okay, so think about something that you're like, I'm going to try to do more of this. Put it in the comments. So let me look to see in all of the chats, what questions might you have? So it was like, I'm going to try to move more. The whiteboards are fantastic where students defend their thinking. Yeah. Like that is the goal is that students are defending what they're thinking. They're not just doing a problem to be done and to get the right answer. Great idea. Willa prove it a lot. Everything is prove it. Are you sure? Teach your neighbor. Does it always work? I need them to really own their idea. Let's see. Showing three ways you can solve this. Susan, that's a great one. I just had a, at their desks. I promise you, Gail, if you just move them a little bit more. 
because then they don't just sit and sometimes that we want to get in a groove. So remember that expressions is a, they have lessons that are more considered conceptual. And then there's lessons that are considered procedural. Like when I open up the teacher's guide and I read through it and I'm like, oh, it's like in partners do this and have students independently work on these. Like, and there's a lot of workbook problems. It generally means that that's a procedural fluency day. So I want kids to be doing a lot of practicing and applying, but the other days I want a lot of movement, right? I want students who are going back and forth. So we don't just like, you know, zone in and work on an entire page. We will do a couple problems then back to the carpet, then a couple problems back to the carpet. And we're never in one place for very long. Let's see other things using a meeting area, like for the, da the daily routine. So not just for the daily routines, use it everywhere. Let's see using our Jenny, Jenny, hey, good to see you here. Using whiteboards daily. What do you notice? What do you wonder? So Leslie, perfect. Like constantly I post a problem. I could be, you know, convert this fraction greater than one. Okay. But first, what do you notice? Them just noticing that it's a whole number and a fraction, or do you even just notice? So notice and wonder is a great strategy for engagement. Thanks, Leslie. Using random grouping. So Missy's talking about building thinking classrooms. So when they walk in, she it, like, it's not just who you're at the table group with. Every day they walk into her room, they have a different group based on the card they pull. So they never know. It's it totally increases engagement because kids have a new set of friends to talk to every single day and they play by a list of rules. So building thinking classrooms, Missy can tell you more about it, but that's a great strategy, Missy. Awesome. So more small groups, solve and discuss. I don't know what Karen numbering. Oh, Kagan. Sorry. I I don't know what it's called, uh, classroom management guru guy. His last name is K-A-E-G-A-N. So numbered heads is a strategy where generally it works best with four kids. So you'd have like a table group of four. You number each kid at the table. So like one, two, three, four. You ask everyone a question. And in, and the way I do it is every kid, all the kids have to stand up. So you have to stand up while you're solving. So everyone stands up. They might have their whiteboard. They might have math tools. And I say, here's your problem. Come to a consensus. So everyone at the table group has to do their own work. They have to solve the problem and then they have to come to a consensus on the answer and be able to explain how they got the answer. So when the whole group has come to a consensus, everyone knows what the answer is and they know they agree on the method. Then the group sits down. Then I can tell at a glance, like what groups are ready. As I get everyone to sit down, then I roll a die, spin a spinner on my smart board, whatever. And whatever number comes up, that kid from every table group, because remember I number them, one, two, has to stand up and defend their group's thinking. If the kid that stands up can't defend the group's thinking, the group loses the point. Because remember, the goal was consensus. And you didn't do your job if there's someone in your group who doesn't understand. So then we continue to go and kids have to argue with each other and defend their thinking and say, well, we think it's because of this and then you know whatever so it's more of like a game type activity but very very effective yes jenny other ways we move in others areas of the day we vote with our bodies we count and compare and trust yeah so think about all the ways that you're already moving with your body like it's puzzled penguin if you agree go stand on that side of the room if you disagree stand on this side of the room if or if you could just argue it like i might say even if you think puzzled is wrong because he is okay but you can argue why you thought he thought that go stand over there like even just moving okay if you think this is an equal groups problem Problem on the left side or on the east side of the room. If you think this is an equal share shrine, go stand on the west side of the room, right? Whatever it is, movement matters. Okay, so let me see if we have more. So Jane's saying she didn't even order the workbooks, planning on using them more with partners. Yeah, perfect. The ones you want. I mean, it's a good way to use it. So there's other things in the expressions they have. What, what do they call them? Not student work, student activity books. So there's actually two different types of books and expressions. There's student activity books and there's student workbooks. The workbook has all the pages. The student activity book, or there's another version of it. I'd have to come up, look up the exact name, but there's two different types of workbooks. That one only has the pages that the publisher thought were the most important. So a lot of times people order that version. It may not be available in everyone's state, but that's a great way to like limit your cost, but also not have as many workbook pages and only get the ones that were that really, they felt like were really necessary to have. I don't know, just a thought. Otherwise, it sounds like you have a solution and you're printing what you need. I'm using them more with partners instead of individual and then start each class with a bug question. More and more turn and talks and math talks. That's great, Jane. Great ideas there.